Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jose Aranda. I work here at the library at Doña Ana Community College. I'm with my colleagues, Susan Botley and uh, Teresa Simeo, uh, and both will be uh, accessible on the chat and uh, we'll jump in if necessary for any questions or needs. You don't need your, uh, your video on. And uh, if you could please mute your microphone until uh, it's time to ask questions, we'll appreciate that. This will be recorded and um, Susan will provide you, and I think it's on the last slide as well, the link where all our presentations are, are housed. So you can look at part one if you were interested. Critical thinking part one, I think I presented back in January or February, it was with the first one, um, but they're all there uh, and you can um, visit that website and review them as you wish. Susan Bontley will be um, monitoring the chat though. So if you have any issues, any questions, feel free to use the chat and uh, we will begin. So as I mentioned, this is part two of the critical thinking. Um, so I'm gonna talk about different things. Um, when I first created this presentation, there was just a lot of information. So we decided it was best to uh, divide it into two presentations. And so this is the second one. And actually this is the last presentation uh, for the semester. Uh, we are going to be working on providing some themes and topics for the summer, like we normally do. And then of course in the fall, but uh, we do welcome you to visit our website. If you can see on this slide, on the top right corner is our contact information. And on, from that website, you should be able to find where all our presentations are housed. Uh, we've been doing this for uh, several years now. So we have quite a, quite a bit of them. So this is part two of critical thinking. The objectives are three. Okay, we're gonna talk about fallacies, uh, weak arguments, and how to improve your arguments. So logical fallacies, or otherwise known as weak arguments, is, is a big, can be a big concern for college students and um, professors, because uh, sometimes students may not realize that their argument per se, whether it be a presentation or a paper, um, fails to meet the, the litmus test of, of logic. So you may have some feedback from an instructor that, that tells you about your argument not following logic or having errors in them. And so what they probably mean are is that it's a fallacy. and um, Fallacies are misleading uh, false notions, okay? Uh, and, and sometimes students don't mean uh, to promote these fallacies in their writings. Uh, sometimes these are uh, promoted online. And so when they search for information, they may come across some of these and think they are accurate. So that's why this is the first one. Uh, I want to highlight that this is, a, this is a skill worth spending some time on, especially when thinking about critical thinking, right? You can't achieve critical thinking if the foundation, if the premises that you're trying to argue are, are incorrect. So something to look out for um, are these fallacies, right? Um, a misleading or unsound argument. Um, so these are several definitions. I hope you get the picture of what we mean here, um, but it's basically coming to the conclusion that your argument fails in, in some way. So as a student, I think it would be uh, prudent for you to keep this in mind, what they are and to avoid them. So how do you find them? Here are some tips. One way is to pretend that you disagree with the conclusion that you're trying to write, right? And concentrate on the parts of your argument um, I'm sorry, one way is to pretend you disagree with the conclusion you're defending. And that way you kind of turn the table 
and see if your argument is, is solid or not. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the opposing side. Uh, we, we, we have a resource that's called that and we promote it highly. Uh, it is um, an excellent resource and a skill for students to learn to, to see what the opposing side is thinking to better their argument. So one way to find a fallacy is to pretend after you've written or you've uh, produced your presentation is to um, play devil's advocate, if you will. Pretend you're disagreeing and see how that looks for you. Another way is to concentrate on the parts of your arguments that seem easiest to attack or suspicious to you. So it's good to have an outline before you write or give a presentation and that way you can itemize for uh, lack of a better word, your argument. And then you can take time going through each of those items in your argument to see how they stand, right? So you can concentrate on the parts, not the whole thing, but on the parts. And that is another way uh, to find fallacies. Um, you list them out and under each one, you list the evidence you have. And then that way you can see which ones have the better evidence, the most evidence and which ones do not. So that is a way to find fallacies, right? You wanna check your evidence to make sure you have enough support for your claims. And that's, I think the uh, big picture for critical thinking, right? Is to make claims that are well supported by credible resources. So a lot of different parts here that I'm throwing out. Um, we've presented on several of them. I invite you to take a look when you can at our website on all of the, all the other presentations we've given. So this slide uh, was giving you some tips on how to find these fallacies because it can be difficult, right? For students, especially when they're stressed, uh, they're inundated with a lot of homework or the research or they're nervous about the presentation of the final paper that they can miss some of these things that, that can be very uh, crucial in finding these fallacies. So these are some suggestions and a couple more. Avoid making broad claims. It is uh, an important skill uh, for students to learn. Um, that you may have gotten away with that in elementary or middle school, but um, when we're trying to think critically, you need to be careful of the words you choose. And so making broad claims is, is a quick way to be discredited, right? Because it's, it's rarely all, right? So avoid words like all or no one, ever, every time, always. Those are words that, are, uh, that should be carefully used and rarely used, right? Uh, it's better to use more specific words like the ones that are listed here, right? Some, many, some may, sometimes, usually. That way you don't make the claim of everyone. You, 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 you're more specific that sometimes this could happen or this may happen. So uh, it's a play on words and it's a skill students uh, should learn how to do, uh, but it takes practice and it takes time. The last one is keep your characterization of others, especially those of your opponents, especially if you're, uh, arguing against another team, another person. Make sure that your characterizations are accurate and fair. And on the previous presentation, I, I don't remember which one, but I know I mentioned that when you argue, you want to attack the argument, not the person making the argument. And I know in today's world can be difficult because we see a lot, especially on cable TV or on the internet, a lot of personal attacks, especially by politicians and, and so forth, right? So um, most of the times those are intended to uh, stir emotion in the audience. So they're not really, they don't really care if they're accurate or not. They just want to instill that emotion on that reaction from the audience. So, but as a student, uh, we need to learn how to be critical thinkers. And so we need to be uh, considerate firm, but also fair with people, uh, any opponents that you have. Uh, attack the issue, attack the argument. Don't make it personal. So moving on to the second um, objective is well, what kinds of weak arguments you, uh, are there? So we, we started with fallacies. There's something wrong with your argument. And now we're moving into 
having a weak argument. So another difference, but in the same ballpark. Um, so you may be criticized by your professors about having weak arguments. So here's some, there are many, 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 many examples. I had to cut many, many slides uh, because there's just so many. And so we invite you, if, if any of these catch your attention to uh, reach out to us and we can help you further understand some of those if you wish. But here are some of the more popular types of weak arguments that uh, you should be uh, aware of. So you may have heard of the hasty generalization, okay? Um, when I think of hasty, I think of Romeo and Juliet or Shakespeare, uh, because that word haste was, I remember uh, learning about it in, in, and we don't, we rarely use that, you know, it's still a, an appropriate vocabulary term in the English language, but it means to hurry up, right? So be careful about the assumptions you make. Uh, you may be rushing to conclusion, right? So that could be an example of making a hasty generalization. You fail to take the time to do research, to take into consideration maybe other factors that may influence, right? So be aware. The other one is missing the point, okay? Just you're off target, okay? You may have an argument and um, you tend to uh, drift from what the premise of the argument should be. So. That's what missing the point means, right? You're, you're going off on a tangent. So be careful of that. The third one is post hoc or false cause. Sometimes two events that seem related in time aren't really related as a cause and, a, as a cause and a, an event or a correlation. And I'll talk about those momentarily. But this, is, this could be difficult uh, at first to identify because the events are very similar. There may, there may be factors that they share that uh, can make it so, right? But one needs to be very careful and critical, right? Look at the details, take your time, be patient, uh, gather all the evidence, look at all the factors. Don't, don't rush, right? Don't be haste, hasty to really determine if the two events really have relevance and if they have that relationship of cause and effect or correlation. So this one's a good one. Uh, and I'll explain more about some of those uh, in just a minute. The fourth type of weak argument is a slippery slope. This you may have heard uh, on the news or in your classes happens when a claim that a Chain reaction usually ending in some kind of dire consequences will take place, but there really is not enough evidence for that assumption. So again, it's kind of like jumping to conclusion. It's kind of like pre, um, assuming that events do uh, are relevant and do uh, cause this this uh, consequence, but in reality, there's not enough uh, there's not enough evidence for that. So be careful of what kinds of claims you make to make sure that they are in line with your argument. And like I said, that are well supported with credible evidence. So that one's slippery slope. And the last one is just a weak analogy. Analogy is an example, right? When you're trying to explain something to someone and you wanna use an analogy, which is an example, for instance, right? You may hear that, for instance. So when you give an analogy, it should help your audience to better understand what you're trying to explain. But sometimes if it's a weak analogy, it fails to do that. So sometimes students may encounter this in their writings or presentations, right? They're trying to compare things, but they're really apples and oranges, something like that. So keep that in mind. Again, we invite you to contact us if any of these don't really make sense to you. We have lots of information and resources to uh, recommend to you. Um, if that's the case, and if you so wish. I'm gonna pause right now to see if there are any comments or questions. I'm looking None. at the chat. I'm sorry? None. No, okay. I'm looking at the chat. Uh, Susan is, is, is posting uh, website uh, links to various things or websites, uh, the, the library's website and probably uh, the link to where all our presentations are held, so. That is good. So now we're going to move on to causes and effects, causes and correlation. I'm sorry. Um, 
and what are they? And you may have instructors giving you assignments or that deal with this or uh, expect you to have this in your writing, right? Because it requires critical thinking for you to identify something that relates and leads to something else, okay? And many times it's not obvious, okay? So it takes a keen eye, it takes patience, it takes a lot of things that critical thinkers use to come up with it. So let me read you the definition, right? So cause and effect is a logical system, okay? It has to make sense. We've already talked about some of the examples in the previous slides of those that do not make sense, where they fail. So we, we wanna make sure you cover that part first. But a cause and effect has to make sense and then it proves, right, with evidence that it happened, that something happened. So um, if you guys are fans of, of police drama or detective mysteries or that sort of thing, kind of that realm, right? You gotta prove that something happened and, and so you need the evidence to prove, uh, of course, uh, I'm not, we're not talking legal or criminal justice here, but as an example, right? So that's the kind of thinking you want uh, to have, you know, how can you prove that something happened? Where's the evidence and so forth? And where's the, the, the reasoning with that? So let me read you the description here. A cause and effect paper, okay? It could be a presentation as well, as I've been saying, answers the question, how did this happen? So I teach history uh, part-time. And this is a common question we ask in history, right? Why did such and such an event or uh, person affect so and so? So how did it happen? Uh, effective cause and, cause and effect analysis can be written on personal topics, perhaps by asking yourself uh, why, why you happen to do something. Although many undergraduates cause and effect papers may examine larger topics and subjects. So be cautious about addressing cause and effects that are a global or historical nature. Work, rather work towards a logical and coherent analysis of more manageable subjects. So we talk about in libraries helping students uh, narrow or broaden their, their focus or topic. So this is um, an example of how this can continue on into the writing or, or the final product, okay? It needs to be make, it needs to make, make sense. And answering the question needs to be revisited continuously. Uh, sometimes, again, students could be fixed on a certain aspect of it and they're excited and they're writing and writing and arguing on that. And then they forget to revisit the question. So they may experience some of the things that we've already covered, right, a week weak argument, stuff like that. So it is important to continuously, as, as you're writing, um, to look back at the questions you see and ask yourself, am I, am I covering this as best I can? Am I answering the question? Is it making sense? And the last part here, correlation, okay? Two events, what are the correlation? Is the relationship. So you need to identify how those two things relate. Um, when one variable changes, the other one changes too. That's the correlation, right? So I don't wanna get into scientific method or you may have some instructors or classes that go much farther into this type of uh, teaching or, or thinking. This is, I'm just covering the surface here of sometimes you need to prove cause, cause and effect and then correlation, two separate things. But the last line here I think is important. Causation is correlation with the reason. That is, that is, I think, uh, the epitome of critical thinking, right? Because you've taken into account the evidence, you are using logic that makes sense, and now you're establishing a relationship and cause. And so that would really, uh, for example, at the conclusion of a paper, really, really um, finish the process um, nicely, uh, in my opinion, and I'm, and I'm probably not explaining that well, but I think if you go through, right, cause and effects and then correlation, then at the last, you're able to explain it all. It really sums it up well. That's the word I was looking for. So cause and effect and correlation. And last but not least, how to improve your arguments. Um, 
I've given presentations on how to how to make outlines, how to take notes. There may be some. I know there is some great information in those presentations and slides that I may have touched already on how to improve uh, arguments. But here's some that deal with today's presentation. So the first one is use effective premises. What are premises? At the bottom, you see the asterisk. A premise is pretty much your position, right? You're explaining a position that you support or a conclusion. So when you use effective premises, that is starting your argument on solid ground, right? Because the opposite would be not on solid ground. If you had weak premises, okay, you're not explaining your proposition well, or you don't support it well, then you're starting with a weak premise. So it's very important to have effective, strong premises that are both true and relevant to the issue. Okay, so keep that in mind. If they're not true, then they are no good for you to use in this context. And if they're not relevant, then what's, there is a logic, right? So I hope you're seeing the, the pattern here, the thinking that we're trying to uh, promote of critical thinking. That it needs to make sense, it needs to be valid, it needs to be accurate, it needs to be well supported, okay? Another number two, how to improve is uh, make sure your premises align with your conclusion, okay? Again, that's that going off on the tangent thing that we need to be mindful of. Uh, it's okay to go on a little tangent as long as you're able to come back to your point, maybe after one example, but not more than that. You wanna always stay with your premise and the conclusion, which is when you're wrapping it up, you wanna make sure that that aligns as well with your premise. So think of the introductory body, introductory body and conclusion, right? Of a typical paragraph or paper. So you want to make sure that whatever you said you were going to do, or whatever you introduce in the introduction is well summarized in the conclusion. Number three, check that you have addressed the most important or relevant aspects of the issue. And the only way by doing this is by doing the research, okay? Because it's during the research that you're exposed to a variety of information, resources, some better than others, et cetera, but you will discover what else is relevant, what are the, meaningful factors, for example. So especially for certain issues, uh, it's, it's highly important, you know, that you address certain factors. So, so for example, the pandemic, right, with, with COVID-19, um, there are a lot of relevant issues for that, right? There's wearing masks, there's vaccinations, et cetera. It's all relevant, but a new one that just came out that I found out is, is ventilation. So uh, some could be more popular than others, but still, the, the, the key here is to make sure that you address the most relevant aspects of the issue and the, of the issue. And, and the only way to do that is if you're well read, well researched. So you need to ask, probe, discover. Okay. And we can help you here in the library do just that. And the last one do not make any claims that you cannot support. Okay. Sometimes you may encounter people that are abrupt in stopping someone, maybe creatively, maybe not, but when they're saying things that just are not true or they can't substantiate, okay? You don't have to do that, but you should be mindful. You should always be mindful of any claims you make. A claim you make should be able to be, should be able to be, uh, Reference by credible resource and evidence that supports it. And, and we've just, we've talked about that in previous presentations, right? You wanna cite your sources and stuff like that, right? Use in-tick citations. But sometimes people speak this way. They'll make claims that are unsupportive. So as students, we need to be mindful of this, especially in college, not to do that unless the assignment is asking you just for your opinion, right? If it's something like that, then yes, you can do whatever you want. But we, when we're practicing critical thinking, we want to make sure we're following the guidelines that we're uh, talking about here today. So any questions? These are short presentations. We want these under a half hour, more or less. These are some of the resources we used. Again, being ethical, you always want to 
the, uh, showcase the resources, you know, it, it should be no secret where you got your information. In fact, it's required. So uh, here's an example of one, and there are many styles. Is there a question in the chat? No? All right. Okay. So uh, I invite you to to browse through some of these resources if you uh, so wish, or if, again, like I mentioned, if you are in need of additional information, you want one-on-one -on -one service, get a hold of us and we'll be glad to help you. And this is how you can reach us. We're available through the telephone, email. Uh, we'll make an, um, a meeting through Zoom if you wish. And we also have chatting from our website. All you can find, uh, or you can come in person, right? Monday through Friday to five at our locations at Espina and, and East Mesa campuses. We're here, we're available for you. We wanna see you succeed. So get a hold of us, please. And almost to the end, uh, Susan will post the link to a survey that we invite you to fill out, please. We use the information from these surveys to improve our presentations. And if you have a topic you'd like for us to explore or give a presentation on, you can also uh, include that information in it too. But in summary, we've talked about quickly uh, what fallacies are, what weak arguments are, and how to improve your argument, all in, within the context of college student work, right? So we are working on like I mentioned, what we will continue doing this in the summer, some of the topics, and then of course in the fall. But this is the last presentation for the spring. So we appreciate you joining us. Susan has posted the presentation survey in the chat box. Before we leave, are there any comments, any questions, anything anyone wishes to? This will be recorded. This has been recorded. I'm sorry. Um, and it'll probably be a couple of weeks for it to be available, but um, it will be made available on our website. Um, this is the link. On this slide, you see the link to the survey that we ask you to fill out uh, so that we can improve these. Um, but I think Susan also posted the link in the chat. If there are no questions or comments, thank you for joining us. We wish you well. And uh, school's still not over. We have about a couple more weeks left. But the library is open for you. Study rooms, assistance, whatever it is you need, uh, we're here for you. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>